introduction. Uh, if I'm uh, invited by an organization named after Murray Rothbard, uh, then I always say yes. Unfortunately, this is the first time in my life I was invited by an organization named after Murray Rothbard. He's an economist who should be better known and better appreciated. I have the privilege of having contributed an introduction to a huge collection of Rothbard's writings uh, called Economic Controversies. And my introduction begins with a sentence, it was nearly 40 years ago that Murray Rothbard changed my life. So thank you to the uh, Romanian American University, but also especially thank you uh, to, uh, to Alex, uh, Putinenyeska, uh, thank you, <laughs> uh, Rothbard Center, uh, who invited me to speak before you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, the, um, the first, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, perhaps the only thing to write down if you're taking notes uh, from my lecture is my Gmail address. I'm sharing with you my more personal uh, address rather than my Baron's address. If there are questions that you have uh, that don't get answered this evening, then write me. Uh, it's, it's in a, it's a, any successful lecture is ultimately a dialogue between you and the lecturer. Uh, I was inspired, and I'm going to mention a left-wing name that maybe some of you aren't familiar with, Noam Chomsky, uh, who actually influenced me very much. Uh, I noticed that some of my deeper, darker secrets were advertised around this university since I've revealed them. Uh, my mother was a member of the Communist Party. I was raised uh, to worship uh, Joseph Stalin. Maybe you heard of him. Uh, so I evolved a little bit in a certain direction, and that's why I hope to be able to tell you on Thursday how to talk to a socialist, since I spent much of my life talking to a socialist who happened to be my dear mom, and that started at around age seven. So I have a lot of experience in that regard. Uh, I should also thank you for allowing me to speak in the only language that I know, English. Uh, my wife is sitting there in the second row, and if I start talking a little bit too fast, the way many New Yorkers do, she's gonna raise her hand a little bit and tell me to slow down uh, so that you can follow me. Well, I want to introduce uh, the topic a little bit by just revealing, uh, the, uh, by taking five minutes to tell you everything I know about the Romanian economy, uh, because unfortunately it is not a whole lot, uh, but it is a couple of things that I can share with you. First of all, I love and admire uh, Romanian movies. Uh, I do think of Romania as the sort of film capital of Europe. I think it's an extraordinary achievement. I don't know where all that talent came from, but I imagine there are some budding filmmakers in the audience, and I hope you do films as good as some of those that I've already seen. Uh, what else about Romania uh, that, to my mind, as an American, as a New Yorker, is extraordinary, uh, but looking around the room, maybe none of you were living through these events as I did. Uh, in uh, 1988 to 1989, uh, those of you who know something about history know that certain extraordinary events were happening in and around Romania. Extraordinary especially for me, who grew up at the age of seven thinking of the world as divided into socialists and, and communists and capitalists. And, uh, and the one thing that we as New Yorkers were told, that even though the Berlin Wall had fallen, even though the Soviet Union was unraveling, uh, there was one country where the government had the people in its grip, and that was Romania. The next day, although, as I remember, virtually the next day, the headlines are blaring, the government is overthrown. Uh, and, uh, and if that doesn't teach you, as it taught me, that the experts can often be absolutely wrong about the future, uh, doesn't teach you, as it can teach me, as it has taught me, uh, that radical change can happen, uh, then uh, nothing will. Uh, radical change does happen. And of course, the, the, the example that I choose usually when I'm arguing with those who resist the re even the possibility of radical change is to point out what happened in countries like Romania, what happened to the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, events that nobody anticipated 
1986, 1987. In 1986, the neoconservatives were calling Ronald Reagan a sellout. Perhaps you know who he was. The president who was supposed to end communism, who was supposed to be safe death to the evil empire. They were saying that the way it was closing up to the communists was bad and that we were going to have another thousand years of the evil empire. Uh, and then, of course, they quickly changed their tune. I'm talking about the neoconservatives. Once uh, these amazing events did happen, and suddenly they were deciding that Ronald Reagan was their hero. Well, that's a story for another day, but that's something else I know about Romania that sticks in my mind, uh, and something that I will never forget, and, and a history that you have, that, which is extraordinary. I admire you for it. Uh, now, let me finally change slides, and, and with the last thing I know about Romania, because unfortunately most of my talk is going to draw on something I do know something about, the U.S. economy. Uh, that's uh, Romania's Economic Freedom Index, as kept by the Fraser Institute, also by the Cato Institute. Uh, the higher the number, the freer uh, you are. And notice, I'm starting in 1995, where the rating was 3.81. That's a ranking, that number, 117th in rank. Uh, pretty low. Uh, Ten years later, uh, there was a huge increase in economic freedom. I could go into how this index is calculated, but we won't have time for that. I, I urge you to read up on it, to understand it better, because it is, I think, very revealing of what goes on in countries around the world. Uh, it, the Economic Freedom Index vaulted to 7.08. That's 54th out of approximately 140 countries, still below the U.S. Uh, and uh, it inched up the most recent number to 718, I 53rd in ranking, because other countries have also improved. Uh, and uh, that's a huge achievement as well for any country. Uh, the US Economic Freedom Index, I should tell you, has declined. It's still higher than that of Romania, but it, it rose uh, through the decades from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then in the year 2000, it peaked and is still in decline. Uh, although, again, as I say, still higher than that of Romania. Well, that's what I know about Romania. Uh, now I'm going to tell you a few things that I know about taxes. And uh, I want to start with a, uh, a one underlying theme in line with uh, the radical position I'm going to take. Uh, this is a credo from Google, a company that you may have heard of. The difficult we can do by this afternoon, the impossible will take a little longer. Well, that's, uh, that, of course, is a credo for a creative company. Uh, but I don't expect that to happen um, to a country because a country consists of, of, of political forces that are less uh, adaptive to change. Uh, but as radicals, uh, we want to believe something like that. We want to believe at least that entrepreneurial companies are capable of that. Uh, I'm going to now hone in on a couple of other themes before I get into the meat of the talk. Uh, another underlying theme about government, as I believe as a free market economist, is that whatever government can do for us is in direct proportion to what government can do to us. So there's always danger in that regard. And finally, the underlying theme, a line from Bill Rogers, who was a famous American humorist, be thankful we're not getting all the government we're paying for. Uh, there is a certain virtue in that the inefficiency of government. In fact, the, the idea that government should be efficient in its purposes uh, has been pushed by many economists, but those of us who wonder about whether government should be uh, arresting people for smoking marijuana or for snorting cocaine hope that it gets less efficient in pursuit of those purposes until, of course, we allow the possibility that all drugs should be legal. To quote uh, Milton Friedman, my friend Camille's favorite economist, whatever, uh, just as government has no right to tell me what comes out of my mouth, it has no right to tell me what I put in my mouth or indeed in my veins. Every man has a right to go to hell in his own fashion. Now that's a quote from David Friedman, Milton Friedman's son. And as you'll see, I'll be quoting a lot of people tonight because I don't want to pretend to you that I'm a, an original thinker. All I'm trying to do is arrange the thoughts of great thinkers and trying to, to gain perspective from them. Now, there's not going to be only one mention of Murray Rothbard this evening, even though he is my mentor. Uh, when you talk about taxes, 
Uh, that Rothbard's position is so extreme, uh, we could spend the evening wrestling with it. I'm going to quote something that's a little bit out of context, but just to tell you a little bit about where he's going and pluck out a phrase. Uh, the object he's writing is not to leave the income distribution the same as if a tax had not been imposed. The object is to affect income distribution and all other aspects of the economy in the same way as if the tax were really a free market price. No market price leaves relative income distribution the same as before. If the market really behaved in this way, there would be no advantage in earning money. Well, uh, he's talking about uh, a tax being something like a free market price. And if you follow him in this book, Power and Market, he leads you gently to the conclusion that should, there should be no government at all. Uh, that the government and its taxation, if it's supposed to replicate the fairness of the free market, is so impossible that the only alternative is Rothbard's credo, which was anarcho capitalism. Now, anarcho capitalism is a tough topic, um, and we're not going to go into it. But I want to at least pluck out one notion about the tax being something like a free market price. And the, the person I'm going to go with and then abandon, as you'll see in a moment, will be Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman, uh, in relation to Rothbard, uh, was a moderate. Uh, as much as he might be called a radical, he was a moderate compared to Murray uh, Rothbard. Uh, who, Rothbard's economics, I happen to think, was sounder than Friedman's. But in this particular case, I'm going to not ask for the impossible, I'm only going to ask for the difficult. And the difficult will be difficult enough with Milton Friedman. So what did Friedman, first of all, say about taxes and spending? Uh, he said, the real cost of government is measured by what government spends, not by the receipts labeled taxes. The goods and services it buys are not available for other use. In other words, uh, I was having a debate just uh, 20 minutes ago with my friend Camille. He was talking about the Laffer curve and taxes, and I was trying to argue that you know we're resetting debt chairs on the Titanic when we talk about taxes specifically. Government taxes us to the extent that it spends. Uh, and that's a, a simple bit of wisdom of Friedman's. In fact, he elaborated on it, just to be clear. Suppose government spends $400 billion and raises $350 billion in funds, label taxes. What do you, who do you suppose pays for the $50 billion difference? The tooth fairy? Hardly. You do. Well, uh, so now we know to look on the spending side of the ledger. But now I'm going to start abandoning Friedman for a particular reason. Now, Friedman posited what I have dubbed the teenager model of government spending. None of you are teenagers, I can tell, so you won't be offended by this analogy. Uh, but some of you were teenagers not so long ago, so you'll understand the analogy. Contrary to the myth that government arranges its finances by first determining how much it needs to spend, it's basically the other way around. Just as your average teenager will spend whatever he can lay his hands on, so too will government. And the solution is the same, cut the allowance. You know, cut, and, and, and indeed, Friedman, on one particular issue, believed in what is called, has been dubbed, I think not by Friedman, but by others, the star of the beast theorem. My view has always been, cut taxes on any occasion, for any reason, and in any way that's politically feasible. Starve the beast. Now that was Friedman talking. Well. Uh, I'm going to abandon that idea for a particular reason, and uh, uh, this is one empirical reason why. Uh, I hope you can follow that chart. That's the ratio in the US of treasury debt held by the public to nominal gross domestic product. I see that uh, the year is a little bit too small on the bottom, but it starts in the year 1850, and it takes us up through the year uh, 2038 which is in the future. Uh, notice the debt, that, and that's debt to nominal gross domestic product. Uh, that's a ratio. Uh, the nominal gross domestic product is, is a proxy for the ability of uh, the economy to support that kind of debt. And that's just treasury debt, by the way. US Treasury debt, obligations of the US Treasury of the federal government. 
And notice that with the Civil War, uh, it rose, uh, with World War I uh, and World War II, it rose. But then, with World War II, it fell. At the end of World War II, it fell. But then it started to rise, and perhaps you see where the gray area is, that takes us up to the present. Without a war, suddenly, government's uh, debt is rising, and now there's a line that goes up to 190% into the stratosphere. And that comes not from me, but from uh, the nonpartisan, very middle of the road, Congressional Budget <laughs> Office of the US. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, again, uh, a government organization, very establishment, but they have, a, they have argued, and uh, I have written this up in Barron's, uh, that uh, the U.S. could go the way of Greece, that the U.S. Has, it, it runs the risk that the debt will get so out of control, up to 190%, uh, that, uh, that uh, there will be a financial crisis in the U.S., uh, similar to that of Greece. And by the way, when I wrote this up, um, uh, I got a lot of response, and, and the response usually took the following form. It was that I was being myopic, to, to, to compare uh, the U.S. with Greece. Of course, I pointed pe to pe out to people that actually I didn't originate that analogy. It came from the Congressional Budget Office. But that was less important than their point that, well, Greece owes its debt in euros in money that it cannot print, doesn't have control over those euros. The U.S., on the other hand, owes its debt in dollars. And we, we won't have to default on our debt. All we have to do is print the money. That's the solution. Uh, the 190% is not going to be a problem. Just let's print it and pay for it that way. Well, uh, those of us who've read a little bit of economics, uh, free market economics, from people like Milton Friedman or Murray Rothbard, understand that doing it that way means that it's analogous to pouring gasoline on a fire. Uh, that could truly lead to a financial crisis. Uh, and financial unraveling, a collapse of the dollar, a takeoff uh, of, the, of, of uh, inflation, uh, price inflation, to double digits and possibly to triple digits. But that's their solution. And of course, uh, that's what happened to the Weimar Republic. Uh, that's no solution at all. It's only the way government, uh, the only solution government knows how to resort to. And indeed, uh, Alan Greenspan, who you perhaps are familiar with, a former Fed chairman, uh, wrote that this was indeed a fear that when the debt does take off to that extent, the U.S. will face that financial crisis. Well, uh, where is the lesson in this with respect to Milton Friedman's teenager model, the Star of the Beast theorem? The lesson in this, unfortunately, is that this government is, is not a teenager at all. Or if this government is a teenager, this is a teenager that has unlimited credit at the bank and has unlimited ability to print his or her own money. That's the teenager you're talking about. And that kind of teenager is dangerous. And the Star of the Beast model, unfortunately, doesn't work because when you do Star of the Beast, it only, the Beast only incurs deficits and debt, and the debt takes off and a financial crisis ensues. So the Star of the Beast model, unfortunately, does not work. Uh, I want to project uh, the one other thing I think I know about Romania uh, is the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, on that side, uh, the ratio comes right from the chart I just showed you. For the US, it was 38% in 1999. It's 73% in 2013, and the Congressional Budget Office projects that there's a danger it can go to 190%. Uh, I looked these numbers up. Maybe economists know better than I uh, from Romania uh, can tell me. But it, it's, you're at 38% uh, in 2013. Uh, it's just that you know, then you're where we were in 1999. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to go uh, the way of the US, but you have less to worry about than the US does. Well, uh, we now know then that, let's wrap, let's consolidate a little bit. Taxes and spending are associated with each other. Spending is the problem, not taxes. Uh, and in addition, uh, you can't really starve the beast very easily uh, and because the beast is going to bottle. So what do we do on the spending side? Well, uh, I'm going to quote briefly from uh, Douglas Elmendorf of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, he wrote, you know, in, in this study that was published, we as a society have a fundamental choice of whether to cut back on those programs or to raise taxes to pay for them. Those programs, by the way, that
that are taking off, uh, that are engulfing the U.S. economy, are mainly entitlements for the elderly, entitlements for the baby boomers, of whom I am one, for example. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, especially Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, entitlement spending that is truly taking off, over which there is no control. But he says, uh, bear in mind, he's saying that, that we, we, we have a choice of whether to cut back on those programs or to raise taxes. But to pay for them, so far, we've chosen to do very little of either. Uh, now, what the Obama administration did was it raised taxes on the top, uh, basically, 1 and 2% of income earners. Uh, it's very, very clear that the, that the only way to, to pay for all of these promises is for there to be draconian taxes across the board on everyone. Uh, but this is bad news that no government seems to have the courage to bring to the people. And for that reason, the debt is out of control. Well, those are the facts. Uh, and uh, we, we're talking about a choice. Uh, let me run through something else that I think is also worth understanding, and that is known as public choice theory. Public choice theory has been called uh, by one of its inventors, James Buchanan, a Nobel Prize economist, politics without romance. Uh, and uh, clearly, clearly, the socialists, the progressives, uh, so many of whom are my friends, so many of whom I grew up with, they believe in politics with romance. They believe that when somebody runs a business, he's crass and self-interested and materialistic. But when you turn that person into a politician, he becomes selfless and, uh, and, and idealistic. And, uh, and he reg only regards the public interest uh, as, his, uh, as his idol. Well, politics without romance, public choice theory, tells us that political actors design policy-making institutions and processes to advance their self-interest normally. That's what they do. They want to win, win, win votes. They don't want to bring bad news to the people. Uh, politics without romance tells us something else, that ordinary citizens have little or no rational incentive to participate active in political activity or be fully informed about politics. Why? Because your ability to affect, the, to affect the outcome in terms of your own position in the world is so limited. Yes, we take an interest in politics. Many of us do. But the vast majority of people, by and large, recognize uh, that it's too many evenings, it's too difficult, that, that too many, that, that there isn't enough time in the day to keep up with an activist, progressive government that does so many things uh, that you can barely keep track of them. Uh, by contrast, people will have huge incentive to inform themselves about purchasing a car or a washing machine. Uh, that's where uh, self-interest and, uh, and, and, uh, and politics really do meet uh, and, and conjoin in a coordinated way. What else does it tell us? That officials have powerful incentives to provide voters and interest groups with short-term benefits and to hide the long-term costs that must pay for those benefits. That's what's happening in the U.S. Uh, it tells us as well that much political activity consists of narrow interest log rolling at the expense of taxpayers. I'll build your bridge to nowhere if you'll build my road to nowhere. Deals are made. We have no time and no energy to keep up with those deals. That's what happens as well. And finally, that the political dynamics of a public policy depend on how it distributes its benefits and costs among voters and groups. And classically, of course, we have the, the agricultural lobby in the U.S. that gets enormous subsidies to rich farmers, a special interest group that benefits greatly, but, uh, but the costs are spread out so evenly among many of us that we, uh, that we don't feel that cost very much. But of course, all of it mounts up. And of course, we can't even affect the outcome. So we have a government out of control for that reason. Well, pulling all of that together, uh, I'm going to summarize and then move on to, to uh, summarize where I'm going uh, so that I don't lose you, uh, hopefully won't lose you, about where, what I'm proposing. Uh, that first we've said that taxes and spending cannot be separated. Um, that spending can take off and get out of control. And that, and that when government is incurring enormous deficits, they're taxing us as well, they're taking those resources from us. Then I've uh, said that in order to have any hope, I will say, in order to have any hope of keeping government spending under control, uh, we advocate the flat tax. 
either on consumption or income, which works best. The flat tax, which is a flat percentage on everyone's income. We'll get to that in a moment as to why I'm advocating the flat tax. Uh, then, borrowing must be restricted to capital investment. Uh, if a government builds something, I'm not necessarily advocating the government build anything, by the way, but in the real world, sometimes it does build things. It should charge for that infrastructure, and, and, and that and the borrowing might be tied to capital investment, but never uh, to, to actual ongoing expenditures, uh, and that central bank money printing to fund government must be curtailed. That's another massive subject I'm going to try to get to. Try to pack a few things into this evening. Bear with me. Uh, the flat tax. I'm going to announce a uh, quote from uh, a guy whose last name is also Epstein, but there's no relation. Uh, a guy named Richard Epstein, uh, who is a libertarian uh, legal scholar. Uh, he writes the following. Classic liberal thinkers all gravitate to the flat or proportionate tax on either income or consumption. One that requires uniform rates for the taxable income individuals, regardless of their aggregate income in any given tax period. In other words, everyone pays, say, 20% on his income. Everyone does. And there's no progressivity in the tax structure. Well, why is that? Is it because I love rich people and I want them to keep their money? Well, uh, I have no particular love of rich people or, or uh, hatred of poor people, uh, but the key virtue of a flat tax is really political. Political. Without it, benefits and costs are completely skewed. So long as most voters know that they will pay no additional federal income taxes for any particular benefit <laughs> program, they can vote for it with the confidence of receiving benefits without making any additional payments. That delusion can persist. And indeed, it's writ large. It's become a tragic comedy in my country, in the United States. We have President Obama constantly saying, let's tax those billionaires and millionaires. It doesn't matter that people like me, columnists like me, can point out that even if you tax almost every penny from those millionaires and billionaires, despite the inequality of income distribution, despite, by the way, the fact that I object to some of that inequality because some of, so much of it comes from crony capitalism, comes from the way government subsidizes the rich. That's a big reason why there's inequality of income, subsidy by government of rich people. Uh, but even so, there just aren't enough dollars in those billionaires and millionaires to go around to pay for all this. But when we pursue that delusion, and, and, uh, and everyone, all, all the 92 percent of the other taxpayers think that the government is a free lunch, uh, then we have a problem. But if we have a flat tax, and if every time government wants more from us to fight its wars, uh, to, uh, to further, further any aspect of the welfare or warfare state, uh, if it is a proportionate tax, and all of us on all levels feel the pinch, then we will have something like the market price that Murray Rothbard dreamt of. Something like all of us understanding that government takes from us uh, and, uh, and government is taking from all of us when it appropriates our resources uh, to spend uh, what it wants. So that's the key virtue of a flat tax. Not an economic reason, but really a reason from political economy, from human behavior. Uh, now, uh, the flat tax has also been an value-added tax. Uh, we, I know you have that in this country, due to its transparency. We want transparent prices. We don't want you to go to the store and think that you can take any good from that store and somebody else is going to pay for it. We want, we want to have a, a, a tax system uh, where people understand in real terms or the only way any of us understand uh, what things cost by paying for them on our own, by ourselves. Uh, now, in practice, I'm going to digress and get into the area where I haven't done a whole lot of research. Um, since its introduction, it does exist, as you probably know. Um, it, um, it, it's existed in, uh, since its introduction in Estonia in 1994. Several countries have followed suit, including Russia, Slovakia, Georgia, and Romania. Uh, but Romania, I guess, doesn't really have it. You're going to have a progressive tax. <coughs> Macedonia and Albania, the Czech Republic and Bulgaria, Bosnia and Hungary. Slovakia, however, has abolished its flat tax rate, but other Eastern and Central European countries are likely to continue this policy, well, I gather, not to Romania, uh, unfortunately. Uh, now, uh, but then we have problems. 
with the flat tax. Uh, and, uh, and the problems that are, have been recently written up. The flat taxes seem to work pretty well when an economy is growing, but not so well when it is stagnant or shrinking. Across Central and Eastern Europe, every country is in need of more revenue because of debt and public deficits says an economist in Bonn, Germany, Germany, there is a feeling that the crisis has affected poorer people more than the rich, and that the rich should contribute more, but that is not easy to do if you have only one tax rate. So I'm not arguing the fact that the flat tax is easy, and I gather that there are issues going on in this country about the progressivity of taxes. Well, ultimately, uh, the solution is to address those debt and, pump and deficits. Try to understand, as difficult as it is, that whatever the government can do uh, for us, it can also do to us. Well, I've covered a lot of ground, uh, but I'm going to end uh, as well with another large subject so that we're aware of the real issues involving uh, public ta taxes and spending, and that's the role of public debt. Uh, Epstein writes again, as I elaborated, in a sound system of public finance, the government's borrowing to meet the cost of capital improvements is acceptable, but borrowing to pay for short-term consumption items is not. It is, in other words, proper to use borrowed funds to create long-term capital improvements, but not to fund short-term government activity like the payment of salaries for public employees. Well, he left something out, and I mentioned it. That's money printing. The debt, there's one catch. The debt can be monetized by the central bank. Uh, we should be aware of that. We should be aware of what goes on. As I've said, the solution to the US debt problem has been to print our way out of it. Uh, so that, too, we have to deal with. Well, uh, not a very uh, a positive picture uh, uh, have I painted. Uh, I want to mention uh, Alan Greenspan's acquiescence in this when he said uh, in his book, The Age of Turbulence, that he has long since acquiesced in the fact that, that the gold standard, which of course is a control on the central bank, does not readily accommodate the widely accepted view of the appropriate functions of government. He candidly admits, namely, the propensity of Congress to create benefits for constituents without specifying the means by which they are to be funded. Now let me quote from another economist I admire who wrote about this problem uh, of, of the ability uh, of, of government to print money rather than tax us. Uh, the, when the government need not obtain its funds from the people, but instead can supply the people with funds, it can no longer easily be viewed as deriving its powers and rights from the people. Uh, I think that's profoundly true. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, we need either the abolition of the central bank, which I advocate, or at least control over the central bank and its ability to print money. Uh, really, the history of money uh, are, uh, and, uh, originates in the idea that government needed to fight its wars. Uh, and, uh, and it did not want to just, it, couldn't, it could tax the people. Uh, but taxing the people when you want to fight a war is never a good idea. So the kings got a good idea. They decided to print the money. Uh, and that's, that's the ultimate appropriation of the people's resources uh, without uh, being answerable uh, to the people. So again, profoundly, not for just for, not for an economic reason. I think there are good economic reasons to abolish the central bank. But for political reasons, uh, the power of the government to print money is a direct affront uh, to, uh, to the government being answerable uh, to the people, uh, and uh, I think it, uh, it must be abolished if we're truly going to have any kind of democracy in any country. Well, uh, drawing back to my summary, taxes and spending can be separated. In order to have any hope of keeping government spending under control, the flat tax either on consumption or income looks best. Borrowing must be restricted to capital investment. Central bank money printing to fund government must be curtailed. That's an enormously tall order, very difficult, practically impossible. Let me then end on one of my radical credos. I've heard this to those who tell us radicals, we have no sense of politics. We respond, you have no sense of history. Um, radical change does happen. Radical change does happen for the better. Uh, we had slavery in the world for thousands of years. Uh, slavery ended. Uh, we had communism, uh, Bolshevism, in so much of the world for so many years. That ended too. Well, uh, good things, radical change, can happen. Uh, it's important, 
uh, as well, however, for us to keep those radical ideas on the table. Um, now, again, I'm quoting Milton Friedman, those radical ideas must be lying around. We always have to keep aware of them because we never know when and where we'll have the opportunity to further and bring about those radical ideas. Thank you. Well,